Gracious God, I thank you for what you have done, for how you have guided us as we have communicated your truths with your people. I thank you for all the ways that you direct us and you enable us to, um, to praise you, to testify about what you've done, to call to you when we are in need. I pray that today you would fill our time, that you would fill it with the power of your Holy Spirit. Enable us to be the spirit-filled leaders and to equip the leaders in your church. And I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So I think it might be beneficial to start with um, Numbers 27. So in Numbers 27, um, if uh, I know you weren't ready for <laughs> looking at this particular passage, so uh, if I can just briefly give kind of the context. So in Numbers 27, they're getting ready to go into the land, the second generation. Um, and it creates this unique situation where one of the people who, one of the families who have been granted an inheritance, um, he dies without a son. So Zolo for that doesn't have a son. Um, and because of that, there were people in the group, in the tribe who said that the land should go to someone else, go to another family. And the daughters of Zulofadad come and say to Moses and the priests, like the, the, the group of elders, and they say, this should not be the case. Um, that property should go stay in the family. And so Moses goes to the Lord and the Lord says, they are absolutely right. It should stay in the family. It should go to his daughters. Um, and no one should have a right to take it away. So this allotment is now given to Zelophehad's daughters, right? So they are the, the leaders in that family. And the Lord establishes them as the leaders in the family. The other person that the Lord establishes is Joshua. And this is where the reference to the Holy Spirit comes. The Lord says to Moses, go up and look over the land I'm giving to the people, but you will not enter it because you did not honor me as holy in front of the people. And therefore I'm going, I'm going to choose someone else to go in. And Moses said, may the Lord God who gives the spirit or breath to all living things, appoint someone over the community who will go before them and lead them out and bring them in so that the Lord's people will not be a sheep without a shepherd. And you might notice that reference there, sheep without a shepherd to what happens with Jesus, right? And then Mo, the Lord says to Moses, take Joshua, the son of man, a man in whom is the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Have him stand before Eleazar the priest and the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. So this sets a precedent that whenever a new leader is appointed, it, this leader is appointed in front of the entire assembly of priests so the priests the elders are to be there whenever a new leader is appointed and this new leader must be appointed by the lord and must have the holy spirit within this leader
Are you with me so far? Yep. All right. The reason I think that's beneficial to discuss here and why I felt like um, why I felt like we should go that route is because in Acts chapter four, you get the the disciples who are apostles, right, have already been filled with God's spirit and are testifying to what the wonders of God and what God has done. And the Lord is adding to their number. <laughs> and then they are in the temple. They are teaching the people. At, in particular, they are at Solomon's colonnade, which is the place where um, you, the people were, the poor were to come. Those who, um, who needed a word from the Lord were to come to that particular place. And the priests were supposed to meet them. Well, the priests aren't doing it. The elders aren't doing it. So the disciples are doing it for them. This is something Jesus did during his life as well. If you remember, we looked in the passages in John when he, he was there at Solomon's colonnade meeting the people. So while they're heading there, they meet, Peter and John meet a lame beggar. What we don't find out until the end of the story is that this particular beggar had been there for 40 years, or 40, uh, yeah, had been there, had been lame for 40 years. Which is the exact amount of time that Israel in the wilderness had been lame, <laughs> waiting to go in and needed that new leader, Joshua, to be appointed to take them in. Peter and John offer to this lame beggar the name of Jesus Christ. And when they offer the name of Jesus Christ, which by the way, might I say, is the exact same name as Joshua. They are the exact same, right? They offer this name that the Lord is the one who saves to the beggar and the beggar is able to walk and leap and praise God. That's what the Lord was wanting for the people of Israel way back in Numbers. That's what the Lord wants for the people who are in Jerusalem for them to walk and leap and praise God, but they have been kept immobile by the rebellion of their leaders. Which brings us to Acts chapter 4. When they hear Peter speaking to all the people and teaching them in the name of Jesus, in the name of Joshua, they get very nervous and the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees are greatly disturbed and take them prisoner. Then they bring them before the priests and the elders. So whenever a new leader or group of leaders is commissioned, they are to appear before the priests and the elders. So here are Peter and John appearing before the priests and the elders. Now it took a resting to get them there, but God got them there. <laughs> it is at this point in verse uh, seven, well, in verse six, we're told that the whole family is there, right? Just like Eleazar's family was there in numbers. Here we have 
Caiaphas's whole family, which include or Annas's whole family, which includes Caiaphas, because there were two high priests of the same family. And they say, what by what power or what name did you do this? And Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit, just as Joshua was. And says to them, you know, <laughs> you know that we are being called to account because of an act of kindness shown to someone who is lame. So know this, it was in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead. Salvation is found in no other name, right? The Lord saves. That's the name in which salvation is there. And Peter testifies boldly. And it is so striking to the priests and the elders that they realized, wait, these are unschooled. Peter and John are unschooled. They're ordinary but they took note that they had been with Jesus. So Jesus has made such a, a big impact on the disciples, on Peter and John, that they look like Jesus and the high priests and the elders recognize it. Just like Joshua looked like Moses and the Lord even says, take the honor and glory uh, that you have and give it to Joshua so that he will be esteemed. Here, Peter and John look like Jesus and Jesus is working through them and the high priests and the Sanhedrin recognize it. And they don't know what to say because the person who was healed is right there. So they, there's power, there is healing, there is salvation, and they can't deny it. They cannot deny that Peter and John are the leaders that God is working through. But they also can't let it go unchecked <laughs> or else their leadership is going to be threatened. So they do what Moses and Eleazar and the people of Israel did not. They try and silence them and say, no, no, do not speak any longer in this name. So they actually go the opposite direction of what Moses and the elders do in Numbers. Moses and the elders encourage Zelophehad's daughters, Joshua. They encourage this new leadership. But the Sanhedrin here tried to silence them. And Peter says, and John both reply, you be the judges. <laughs> what is right to do in God's eyes? As for us, we're going to keep speaking about what we've seen and heard. <laughs> One of the things that could be come a focus as well is the end of Acts chapter four. So once they're released, Peter and John go back to their people and report all that happens, right? And when they heard this, all the disciples and apostles, all the people gathered, pray together, sovereign Lord, you are the one who made the heavens and the earth. You spoke by your Holy Spirit through your servant, David. Why do the nations conspire, the people's plot in vain, the kings of the earth rise up together against the Lord and against the Lord's anointed one? If you wanted to do Psalm 2, that's a great one. 
that connects because Peter or the people actually quote it here. And then they say, indeed, all the nations and the leaders are conspiring together. Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, the people of Israel, the leaders who just conspired, they did what uh what you predicted would happen and so lord consider their threats and enable us to speak with boldness perform wonders bring healing make and enact signs so through the name of jesus so they're not going to <laughs> be silent about the name of jesus even though they were instructed by the leaders to do it and what you see is a replacing of leadership where Peter, John, the disciples who are now apostles are going to become the leaders who are going to guide the people so that they are not sheep without a shepherd. And after they pray, the entire place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So you get a filling with the Holy Spirit here in Acts chapter four. This is the third time all of them are filled with the Holy Spirit. If you look at John and then the Acts chapter two, now Acts chapter four. What was the first? John. In John, when Jesus breathes on them, the Holy Spirit, oh, and they are all filled with the Holy Spirit, right after the resurrection. So it's in John 20. One of the things that I think is significant about this is that the entire place is shaken, right? There's an earthquake. And the reason I find that to be significant is because the Lord does this repeatedly throughout the te Old Testament, New Testament texts. Whenever God is going to establish leaders, I can go through some of those. Oh, go ahead. You didn't finish your statement. When he's going to establish leaders, he shakes them. God shakes the ground. So I can go through a few of them if you'd like. Yes. So <clears throat> here are some uh, examples of that. The earth is shaken in Exodus 19, 18, when, uh, when God has Moses come before him and Moses speaks and God answers. So God establishes Moses as the leader in that passage. Another example is number 16, when God establishes Aaron as the priest as Korah is rebelling against Aaron and his family. In 1 Samuel 14, 15, when Jonathan is established as a leader to deliver the people from the Philistines. Elijah at Mount Sinai, once again in 1 Kings 19, and then you have Amos, who talks about how the Lord's going to overthrow the rulers of both Judah and, uh, or Israel in particular, but also Judah and the neighboring nations, goes through all those leaders and says, the Lord's going to overthrow all of you <laughs> and establish a new leader, that being uh, Hezekiah. And then, if you remember in Matthew 27. What was the passage in Amos? 
Yeah, so it happens, it bookends the book of Amos in Amos 1 and uh, the last chapter in Amos. I think it's 14. Let me double check. Nine in Amos nine. So it bookends the book of Amos with the Lord shaking the leaders. And then lastly, of course, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. There are two earthquakes three days apart. In each There's one. Oh, go ahead. I was just no finish. Finish this part. I've got another question. I was going to say you, you didn't right. put anything in there about Revelation and the earthquakes that shake. Yeah. So uh, I was going to go to Revelation because the earthquakes are going to shake up Gog and Magog and the leaders there, and completely um, and establish the 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 martyrs as the leaders. There are some other references that could occur or that could connect as well, where it doesn't actually say earthquake, um, such as like Noah in, in Genesis. It says that the foundation split. I think that makes sense as an earthquake, but it doesn't actually say it. Um, oh, I almost forgot. There's another one in Acts. <laughs> Sorry, Acts 16 at Philippi when Paul and Silas whoa, are established um, in Philippi. Can't forget that one. So what were you going to ask? Well, now I, I still want to ask what I want. I want to ask about Joshua. If I forget, remind me, I want to ask about Joshua. But um so is is there something to this uh they're they're in an area of the world that earthquakes are uh very frequent uh, you know this is normal uh forever the shaking of the earth whether you are jewish or pagan has been associated with actions of gods. Uh, it didn't matter what God you believed in. Is, is there something to that? Is there something more to the idea that God is shaking the world when leadership seems to be passed? Is, is this an affirmation that everybody would understand? Well, you know, is there something more to that? Yeah, so... Um... I think, I think it's different for each culture because there are ancient Near Eastern cultures such as like Ugarit and um, there's Babylonian literature on this where the shaking means that the deities are angry because right. they're not being worshiped or they're not being worshiped properly. Right. And so it's a sign that uh, the deities are angry and there's a need to appease the deities but there are other like the Hittites who say no these are demons that are shaking the ground and you need to get the right incantation to counteract it so it varies from culture to culture but for so how is it that in the Jewish culture then this is taken to be a sign of affirmation yeah so there's the in in the biblical text there's the pronouncement of god to say this is who i'm establishing and it is met with the sign of the ground shaking and so i think that at least in the biblical text that's how it comes to be connected with um okay this is god shaking up the leadership and establishing a new leader okay. 
And I think it, it comes from timing and what's happening in the, the narratives, especially in the Torah, that then this becomes a recognizable theme throughout the rest of the text. Yeah. Okay. My, uh, my question about Joshua was this. Is there something to the fact that we've got Peter and John who got to witness uh, Moses and Elijah meeting with Christ on uh, on a mountain, on the, right? On the mountain. And we've got Joshua that was the only one if and unless I'm totally wrong about this, and that happens a lot, Moses didn't go up on the mountain alone. Joshua actually accompanied him up on that mountain. So in Exodus, is that, is that not true? So in Exodus, God tells Moses to bring Aaron up. So Aaron goes with Moses, and then Joshua stays towards the the bottom of it. Okay. Okay. But he is constantly with Moses because he's his um, he's his aide. He takes care of his clothes. Right. So, so you know, Joshua, everybody else stays down. Joshua actually makes at least part of that journey. Right. Moses. He doesn't go all the way up. Right. Isn't the, in other places though? Doesn't it almost imply that Joshua went up? Well, it says that Moses came down and Joshua met him. So Joshua is waiting on him, is what the texts imply. And then Joshua's the one. So there's a there's a story where um, the Lord says, okay, these elders are going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit and be able to prophesy. And they do. And Joshua is the one who comes from the camp and says, wait. There are two others that have received it who are not here with us. So it indicates that he was in the camp waiting. Hears them prophesying by the power of the Holy Spirit and comes to Moses and says, should we stop them? Okay. Which Moses says, no, don't stop them. I don't know. I guess I've always thought that, that Joshua, at least in part, maybe with the second set of tablets or something he went up there because i thought it implied that joshua had most of if not all the same experiences with the lord that moses had had i've always kind of heard that and i don't now that, i can't pick up i mean there is the indication that joshua is um experiencing things with moses because moses would go into the tent of meeting and then leave the tent of meeting right but Joshua stays there continually. So it's it's more once the tabernacle is established, then Joshua experiences all those encounters with the Lord. Right. Okay. It just it just seems to me that that when you're connecting, and I like this connection back to uh, Numbers twenty seven, where. Uh, by the way, I, I love, I, I think there could be some time spent on uh, the ease at which Moses receives basically what's a chastisement from God and says, okay, uh, you're done with me. Don't leave the people, you know, without a shepherd. Uh, right. I, I, I think there could be some time spent on Moses's uh grace and I, I i just do uh his faith in god that i've done my job for you i get it um well but, but and there seems to can be I something on with, that? yeah go ahead because i no, i think no, there's no, that's no, worth no. conversation absolutely so uh in numbers when when god says i'm not going to allow you to go in it is, um, he, Moses and Aaron led the people to trust in them. Am I frozen? No, you're good. Go on. Okay. 
Moses and Aaron led the people to trust in them rather than in God. And God says, okay, now I have to remove you so that the people will trust in me because you're not going to be with them forever. And so I think yeah. Moses accepts that it's for the best. It's for their good that he doesn't go in. Because in Deuteronomy, yeah. he even says, it's for your benefit that I don't go in. And, and this is a lesson, I think, as you follow it through scripture, uh, preaching-wise at least. You know, David learns this lesson very well. Um, and there can be that distinction between Saul and David, where, where Saul wants the people to follow him. David is constantly, uh, even with all his sins and mistakes and, and the horrible things that he does at times, He's always stepping out of the way willingly for his yeah. son who is rebelling. And he's saying, if this is what God wants, I'm not standing in the way. Um, that, that's, that is a theme that in leadership for the Israel, the nation of Israel, you, you, can, you can see that type of, of, uh, of uh, theme just playing itself out time and time again. I, so agree. I, I think there's good stuff there. And I think it's hard for many of us in leadership to do, to step aside and say, let God take this person or this group and raise them up instead. That's hard. Yeah. The Sanhedrin's not willing to do that. <laughs> yeah. But then, so then it, it seems, I, I would have to be careful uh, if I'm going to draw comparisons between a Peter and John, and they get to see Moses, and they get to see Elijah. In other words, they, they essentially get to be taken back into numbers. They get to be taken back into the history of Israel. Um, but Joshua may not have been as connected to Moses as Peter and John were to Christ. To the third Joshua, yeah. 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 But there is something there. I think so. There and is I something think, there, but that's tenuous. Yeah. Well, I think what you might be, um, I think if I could phrase it somewhat differently, um, you could tell that Joshua had been with Moses. It marked yes. him, right? Right. Just as the Sanhedrin notices these people have been with Jesus. <laughs> I think that's where our, I think that's where I'm going with this. Um, it, it is it is not some random person right. that when Elijah throws his mantle, you know, it's it's to Elisha who's farming on the side of the mountain. Um, he hasn't yeah. been spending time with Elijah, but this one, Joshua had been spending time with Moses. Peter and John had been spending time with Christ. Um, yeah, there's, there's something there. And Elisha does. He does become the ward of Elijah and spends time with him. And because when Elijah Elijah's done, taken up, he's got what, two or three years. He's when Elijah's years. taken up, yeah, the, the school of prophets recognize, oh, the spirit of Elijah's on him, right. the same spirit, right? So, it, so it I think you're right there. Yeah, it happens. It just happens over the next 10 years, as God says, you can be done, but not until you've trained the guy that's coming after you. Right. So there, there is something there, even in the Elijah-Elisha exchange. Yeah. And I think, I think there's something there for us as well. You can tell when someone has been with Jesus. <laughs> yeah. It marks the person differently. And I yeah. think the I think the sign of leadership is that, or it was supposed to be based upon numbers, that you could see the marks of the Holy Spirit or the um, fruits of the Holy Spirit in that person's life. And that is what the leaders cannot deny. <laughs> right.
So Psalm 48, if, if you want to discuss it, um, has some connections here because the Lord is the one who establishes the leaders in Psalm 48. The Lord is the one who establishes the, the, the fortress, the heights of, of Zion, establishes it as establishes the leader as being secure and when the kings and the four and the leaders come against to attack the lord shakes them and sends a a breath or spirit or wind to destroy them in order to protect the ones that the lord has established and i think we see something similar happening in acts as the leaders in Jerusalem, these pastors, are refusing to accept the leaders God has appointed. And so God shakes things up to say, no, these are the leaders on whom I put my spirit, who are going to shepherd the people. And you're not going to be able to stand against them. So that's why Psalm 48 it might have some really good connections. It also, Psalm 48 also talks about the um, God making someone secure or shaking them, but also your name, O God, is what will go out to the ends of the earth. And here we have the name of Jesus being um, going out through the disciples. So I'm, I'm thinking in this moment about the application of this. You know, we're going to be preaching on this. It's great teaching for certain, but but what what are what am I asking my people to do with it? And I'll just be real honest. In this moment, there's a lot of fear and trepidation for me preaching this as we've received it, because I'm basically telling my people, the person who's following me, you're going to tell really quick whether or not they are of God or not. And that's a very self-serving sermon for me as I'm leaving, I feel like. Um, and so I'm, 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 asked, I'm saying that to say, what other application can we give to our people other than just me telling my people that I'm getting ready to leave, <laughs> look real closely at who God has brought in and see whether or not they're actually of God or if this is just, the, uh, Keith made a comment about you know, our bishops and, and our leadership now and the way they're doing things and not and dragging things out and not necessarily pursuing what God is doing. If that's our perception, again, but... If, if that is indeed true, if if what you are saying is true, and I, I trust God's spirit within each of you um, <laughs> to be able to discern what is true, uh, if that is indeed true then God will raise up leaders and they may not be leaders with positions or titles mm. like Peter and John who were ordinary, <laughs> ordinary, pe unschooled people. Galilean fishermen. Yeah, totally. Or like Joshua, who is this brick bricklayer servant or like Elisha, who's this farmer, like God can put God's Holy Spirit on someone who is not in a position of leadership and fill that person or that group of people. It could be a group. And so I think you're in a unique position to say those in appointed leadership cannot oppose what God is doing. And you'll recognize God's spirit because it will be the one who stretches out. It will be the ones who are preaching the name of Jesus with boldness, who are offering healing to those who are in need or suffering to the poor, who are doing the wonders that God is establishing. You can tell who is filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And even just going through, these are the marks of the, of the person filled with God's spirit. One, are, do you, would you qualify? <laughs> Might be a question you could ask. But two, do you recognize those who, who are the leaders, who are the true leaders? Because you don't need a position or a title just to be a leader. Peter and John never get the title priest or high priest or part of the Sanhedrin. And yet they are the leaders. They are the pastors. You put, you put three qualifiers there. Those who are proclaiming the name of Jesus, those who are seeking to heal the sick, and you put a third one there. Yeah, seeking to offer healing to the sick and the poor, and through whom God is doing wonders. So there's the speaking, there's the reaching out to, to heal and offer help to those in need, and those whom God is doing works of answering their prayers in wonderful and undeniable ways, right? When a lame man who's been there for 40 years is healed, you can't deny it. That was God. Or when the waters of the Jordan at flood stage just stop flowing, you can't deny that. That was God. <laughs> when God works and you can't deny it, that's a mark. There's a part of me that wants to be really cautious here because that third one, then are any of us qualified? I don't know if you heard the last of my statement or not because you froze for a brief second. I did freeze. I couldn't quite hear. It, there, it caught, it clicked out. Okay, so I said, there's a part of me that wants to be really cautious because with that third one, I wonder if any of us are qualified. Has God moved miraculously I, through us? Where God has um, miraculously used your words to connect with so what someone's experiencing or miraculously brought healing to someone in your congregation? I think he's talking more of the signs and wonders part as opposed to offering to help. Well, no, yeah, the hard part with this one is that it's only something God can do at specific times, right? So the earth shaking, that's something God does. The healing of the lame man, that's something God does. And so we can't force God to do that. But it is a recognition of this is someone in whom God has positioned the Holy Spirit and the authority to lead. If you look back on the fruits of the Holy Spirit in Galatians, those are great examples of someone who is filled with the Holy Spirit. You'll be able to see the Holy Spirit has been working because there is that peace and patience, that kindness and gentleness, that faithfulness and self-control. You'll see each of those present in the wake of what has happened. And if that's in the wake of your ministry, I would say, yeah, God has appointed you as a leader. We have ample uh, examples in scripture. You know, it, I talked about this a little bit last Sunday, and that is uh, before I dug into the Holy Spirit and that, that miracle nature of uh, God pouring out his spirit with tongues of fire, so on and so forth. Um, I talked about what are the purposes, what are the purposes of miracles? And, um, and, and one of the things that, that I believe in that, feel free to correct me, uh, Doc, but um, God, God is not always just working miracles. God works miracles 
as he begins to move and literally shift things and change things in the world. Because we have ample uh, examples in scripture where we, we don't see signs and wonders as in miraculous healings or, but we see God working through people. I'm thinking the book of Ruth. I'm thinking the book of Esther, where the name of God is barely mentioned from the standpoint of God doing anything, but it's people being faithful, called to stand in front. So we have examples other than just these miraculous events. And by miraculous, I mean supernatural, something that cannot happen. Uh, there's nothing that happens in Esther that a person couldn't do. The key is that she does it in the name of God. Uh, she is faithful to the calling of God on her life, but there's nothing supernatural about what Esther did. There's nothing supernatural about what Boaz did uh, or Ruth or Naomi. Um, so we, we've got examples of tremendous leadership, people appointed by God to do things without miracles, the signs and wonders of miracles, uh, heralding or proclaiming that. And, and I just say that because, you know, Christ is, seems very clear when he says to us, the purpose of signs and wonders is not for your benefit, it's to proclaim God. And it's to proclaim what he is doing. Um, so, you know, correct me anywhere there. But, you know, when we talk about those three things, um, when we get to number three, miracles performed, I, I think it's legitimate to say work of God performed, uh, well, even when the supernatural is not evident. evident. Yeah, so I think... What we might be, um, I think you might have identified really well, maybe some of the disconnect in language, um, because number three wasn't miracles. And I think maybe I draw a distinction between miracles and signs and wonders. Okay, say more about that. So what was number three then? Uh, the, when God performs signs and wonders. I'm taking this right out of Acts uh, 430 or 429 and 30. So and I think that, say more about signs and wonders then. Yeah. So Esther is a sign of someone who is um, seeking the Lord in, in fasting and seeking to promote the welfare of the people right? And a sign of wisdom as she acts wisely and boldly in everything. She is a sign. And the wonder that occurs in that book is that the lots are reversed. Right. Those are signs and wonders without miracles, as you mentioned. So you can have signs and wonders without a miracle. Sometimes miracles can be part of the signs and wonders. When Jesus instructs the servants and the water changes into wine that's a sign and a miracle but you can have signs that aren't miracles the psalmist um in psalm 71 says make me a sign for people to see how you uh how you establish someone who trusts in you that person that's your connection, that's your connection back to galatians 5 with evidence of the fruit of the spirit okay right so the the wonders of god are that situations can be changed and it doesn't necessarily take a miracle to change it but that the people's hearts and minds are changed that is the wonder of god and sometimes as you mentioned it just takes a simple act of courage, like Tamar to Judah or Ruth and Boaz to Naomi. It just takes a little bit of 
courage and doing what is right in God's eyes. And God can change hearts. And that is the wonder of God. Yeah. I appreciate I, the distinction. Yeah. I think miracles often occur when people are resisting what God wants. Okay. So we often say we want miracles, but do we really want God to do something because we're resisting it and show us, look, my power here is to convince others who are, would not be convinced without that miracle. Back at the beginning, you talked about with Joshua and Ford, there were three things that you said that happened with Joshua. He went he went before all the priests or all the leaders. He had the spirit of leadership. What was the what was the third one, please? Yeah, so if we if we go back to numbers. So Joshua is recognized as someone in whom is the Holy Spirit. Joshua is sent before the, um, the priest, the high priest, and the assembly of elders and priests. And Moses is told to give his honor and glory to, Mo to Joshua. So there's a transferring of honor and a, and yeah, and fame from Moses to Joshua, which is what the Sanhedrin denies in the book of Acts. So when, so a couple of things. Um, so they were in Solomon's colonnade which you mentioned was where the where people who wanted a word from God were supposed to go. Is there any additional connection to that? Remember back, that's that's where the Maccabean revolt began to take place. So is there anything, is, is there another connection there um, in terms of the in terms of the leadership then? Yeah. So <clears throat> as you brought up with the Maccabean revolt, there is the um and that is once again a testimony of of miracles it's people looking for a sign from god a wonder from god some uh some communication from god that their circumstances are going to change well the the leaders in my opinion the sanhedrin annas caiaphas their families they don't want things to change which is why they never go there they don't want the people's lives to change. They don't want the widow's lives to change. Mm. They don't want the leadership to change. <laughs> so they do not go there to meet with the people who are looking for that type of change. And is there a scripture passage that tells us they weren't going? Well, <clears throat> no. <laughs> Except when Jesus goes there, um, they do not go to meet him. When Peter and John are there, they do not go to meet him. Instead, they send the guards and some of the priests. But the high priest never goes there. So, so they were supposed to just be hanging out at the colonnade all day waiting for people. And the no. fact that they're not there when they come... Yeah, so one of the jobs of the, this is going back to the tabernacle, one of the jobs of the, the priest or in the high priest is that they are to meet people as they enter, right, and then go with them to where they needed to be in order to connect with God. So they are to meet people at the entrance and then go with them. They don't. They stay back in the in the recesses of the temple. At least narratively, that's where they're depicted. 
So can I say for 100% certainty, they never went there? I can't. But at least the narrative doesn't cast them there. In that picture. Yeah. So they were sitting in their office and just came out to preach and then went back into their office. They never connected with the people. That's how the narrative presents them. And not only that, but they also invite people to come in to judge them. <laughs> so... <laughs> Okay, come into my office and I'll give you a good whipping. Yeah, or tell you not to defy my authority. Yeah. So when so when this happens with Peter and John, obviously they're being established as leadership of the church. Do you think there's also something going on here that they are replacing the Sanhedrin as the leadership of Israel? I think so. Because, um, yeah, rather than giving too much away, later in Acts, all the Jewish people who are in the synagogues spread throughout the Roman Empire are going to seek their counsel and their leadership, not the Sanhedrin, not the high priest. We're going to see Caiaphas and Annas just fade away. Because as you said last week, being Israel means to be those who are wrestling with God and those in whom God is wrestling. And Annas and Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin are no longer wrestling with God. They're just trying to maintain things the way they want them. Yeah. And it's a, it's a huge temptation for anyone in leadership. Both then and today. Where is it where I was trying to find it quick and, I, and, I, and I'm not. Where is it that once Peter and John continue to preach, um, they're taken back in again and um, who the, the high priest, I think, says, look, if this, is, if this is a thing of God, we can't stop it. Yeah, and it's just right after that. And yeah, so. if we try, we're going to be found opposing God. Yeah, so that's going to be in uh, Acts 5, but it's actually going to be Gamaliel who makes that statement. Yeah, that's 533. They, they actually want to flog and kill, and Gamaliel says, wait a second, if this is from God, we're not going to be able to stop it, so let them go. You know, I, I love this signs and wonders, chapter 3, verse 10. They knew that it was he who sat begging at the beautiful gate, and they were filled with wonder at what had happened to him. And then you connect that to chapter 4, verse 30, that you talked about. Um, now look, you know, Lord, look on their, uh, grant your servants that with all boldness may speak your word, stretching out your hand to heal signs and wonders may be done so i really i like that connection that you made there that's a great uh linguistic tie you picked up there and i think it goes without saying that this is jesus <laughs> who is continuing to act right Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's that's uh, somewhere around there. Is that what you said? 330? Is that what verse you just read? I read 310. 310. And then I read 430. 
So can we, I don't know that I'm doing anything with it, I just care. So do we, do we think we can pull a, a, a supposition that Gamaliel was a follower then, and this is in some way the beginning of the end of the Sanhedrin as he's making this statement? Um, I mean, I might, I might hold off on uh, Gamaliel a little bit, um, simply because <laughs> uh, Gamaliel is the one who trained Saul. So not so much. Okay. <laughs> I think Gamaliel has tons of wisdom and um, knowledge, and it is potential. It is there is the potential that um, he was a follower of Jesus. That is a potential. Um, Saul is going to who becomes Paul is going to say, "I was trained by Gamaliel," right? That was my mark of authority. But you can't say for certain that Paul agreed with everything that his teacher taught, right? You can't right. say, oh, Gamaliel said persecution because here Gamaliel saying, wait, let's not persecute. So those seem to clash. Right. And sometimes that happens between a leader and a student, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's possible. I do think Paul is going to draw on many of his teachings from Gamaliel in the future, and it is going to be beneficial for him, um, the training that he's received. So I do think there's some positive influences that Gamaliel offers. I wish somewhere in the text that it said Gamaliel was a follower of Jesus. It never does. We do have some traditions about Gamaliel becoming a, a, a witness um, of Jesus, in particular in Turkey, but. So you, you had titled this one, The Spirit Comes to Fill. The focus seems to be on leadership. Is it so? Is that where we're comes to fill? That's why leadership? I shifted. Yeah. I shifted to the Spirit enables leaders or enables leadership. There is the filling, right? The third filling, but. I think based upon our discussions and characteristics, it might, this is a more helpful way to go. Uh, interestingly, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition and Catholic traditions, it says that Gamaliel was baptized with his son Abibo and Nicodemus by Peter and John. Interesting. And that he ends up, uh, yeah, becoming a, a, a witness within, yeah, um, what you said about Turkey. There we go. That's the word. Asia. Yes. But I didn't know, according to their traditions, he was baptized by Peter and John. Interesting. Photios of the first of Constantinople and the Clementine literature that he he was secretly a, a follower of the way and then was eventually baptized with his son in Nicodemus huh. by, by Peter and John. So you're on strong ground there. I don't know if there's anything to do with it in this one. I'm just wondering, I was just wondering about peace. Yeah. Nicodemus has always been one of my favorite characters for some odd reason, just because, you know, he he's a person who's prior to Jesus already has great authority. He's got a position and it's and it seems evident he's wrestling with, is it really enough? Is what I'm doing right? Am I on the right track? And, and you don't really see him in Jesus's lifetime swerve from that. 
but after his death, you see him join Joseph and, and now say, nope, I'm going this direction. Yeah. I mean, because just his very act of working with Joseph to, to take care of Jesus' body would put him on the outs with the Sanhedrin. Right. Well, even his comment kind of, because he says, does our, does our tradition condemn a person without a trial? And they say, see for yourself that nothing good can come out of Galilee. Like the, the members of the Sanhedrin attack him for that comment. So you do see that splitting away in John. And he's a great character. I agree with you. I think you drew out his, um, his commitment increases. I gotta take this. Well, I can let you go if if we are done. You've been very helpful to me. I've got lots to think about. And I don't have to preach this week. You again, so <laughs> I'm off. Well, you're um, not preaching the next one. I'm, I was going to say, I'm off the next one. Oh, that's, that's Acts 5, what you were just talking about. That's right. I'll set my I'll set my two lay leaders up. So <laughs> that's the way to do it. Preach about leadership and then hand it off to them. And then hand it off. <laughs> you go. What are you doing here? This one. <laughs> I better stop this recording. <laughs> <laughs> or you better stop it when you use it to teach. <laughs>